Okay. So welcome everybody to our uh, uh, weekly seminar series. Um, we are extremely happy to host this uh, week, uh, Dr. Mimonitu Opuwari from um, University of Western Cape in South Africa. Last week we were in Russia, this week in South Africa, next week to the United States, we are moving from continent to continent. One of the good things of this uh, uh, pandemic situation, I guess. So Dr. Opurwari uh, obtained his master in applied geophysics from the University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria and a PhD in applied geology at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. Mimo is a senior lecturer in petroleum geology and head of the Petroleum Geosciences Research Group at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. He has about 13 years of research experience in onshore and offshore basins of South Africa. His main research area is basically in petrophysics. Mimo is the immediately immediate past secretary of the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, APG Africa Region Secretary between 2016 and 2020, and a member of the APG House of Delegates until 2022. Coordinator of APG Visiting Geo Geoscientist Program, VGP in Africa Region until 2023, and visiting scientist at the, at actually it was a visiting scientist at the Department of Marine Geosciences in our department, the University of Haifa. So um, I remind all the students that um, you can ask the questions at the end or just write them in the chat. And, um, and Mimo, the podium is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nicholas, for the kind words and introduction. Yes, so this is just one of the works we've done. So I want to present the work on delineation of sandstone reservoirs into flow zones of the central Bridasdo Basin offshore South Africa. And the work we use core data for that, uh, for the work I'm going to present to you today. I just have to also indicate that I have to be a bit slow and also to let you know that I have accent, that means the way I may pronounce some of the things or terms, you may not be able to get it. So I will appreciate if you can possibly ask your questions, possibly at the end of the presentation, I'm going to be a bit fast. It's going to take about 30 minutes, then we are done. So Charlie, Nico, are you going to handle the answer and question time or should I just take them as they come in? Um, they will probably ask all the questions at the end. So, and okay. don't don't take care of the chat if something somebody uh, everything will be at the end. Okay, so just okay, it's fine. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So the main work, aim of this work is actually to produce a static geological model for the Bridasdor Basin that is known at the moment. So myself and the other researchers in the group, we also team up with other researchers maybe in Israel and also in UK to see how we can produce a conceptual geological model, a flow generation for the Bridazor Basin. We started one with uh, the Northwest Bridazor Basin, we published one. We've done also for Platmos Basin. So what we are doing now is also on the central Bridazor Basin. So I just produced some of the results we've done on the central Bridazor Basin of South Africa. So this is the outline of the introduction. I'll do the introduction, materials and methods, presentation of results, then with closing remarks. So I start by possibly because of the audience, most people don't know more about South Africa. So I just indicate some highlights of South Africa. About South Africa, South Africa stands out as the most developed nation in Africa, as well as one of the richest that we have in Africa. This is map of South Africa, it's on the southern part of the continent. What you see here is a map of Africa. South Africa is sitting here. 
South Africa also comprises only 4% of the area. It's clearly showing in figure one. It consumes more than 50% of the continent's electrical power. Population of South Africa is estimated to be more than 58 million. In terms of the energy, the primary energy resources in South Africa is coal due to very large coal deposits, a large coal mining industry has developed in South Africa. And South Africa also has improving reserves of more than 30 billion tons. And it's actually ranked the seventh largest in the world in terms of coal production. It is also the world's largest, six largest coal producers. So in terms of coal, South Africa is doing very well. But when we move down from coal to hydrocarbon, it's not doing so much in terms of hydrocarbon because bulk of it over 90% is being imported overseas. So oil import, South Africa imports approximately 90% of its crude oil requirements mainly from Saudi Arabia, about 43%, Nigeria, 34%, Angola, 13%, Ghana, and 3%. So the other percentages are being produced locally. And in terms of consumption, current domestic consumption is about 533,000 billion barrel per day. So in terms of local production, production of liquid fuels from coal using sasol sintol processes with minor contribution from domestic fields. The fields we have the ECE and FA fields. These two fields are part of the Bredazo Basin I'll be presenting to you this afternoon. This is just an overview of attractive location and fiscal terms in South Africa. The Bredasto Basin we're presenting is located here within the Otaniqua Basin. Recently, Total has actually announced latest discovery. Last year, they drilled in the southern Otaniqua Basin, and they've had two discoveries. The first one was in 2019, Brubalda discovery, and the last, latest discovery is 2020. It's just recent, last year. They discover oil here. So they also have two other prospects they have to drill maybe in 2022 and 2023. So let me talk more about the offshore environment of South Africa. South Africa is also a very large country. Its land area is more than 1 million, 1.1 million square kilometer and this coastal has a total length of nearly 300 thousand kilometers. In terms of the structural elements and sedimentary basins, South Africa's offshore basins can be divided into three distinct uh, tectonic zones. One is the Western offshore basin, comprising the possibly a broad the passive margin basin related to the opening of South Atlantic in the Cretaceous. This is known as the Orange Basin. So the next one is in the east offshore is narrow passive margin that was formed as a result of the breakup of Africa, Madagascar, and Antarctica in the Jurassic. So the last one we have is also the southern offshore region known as the Otaniqua Basin. The Otaniqua Basin is where the Bredasdo Basin is one of the sub basins in the Otaniqua Basin. It shows the history of strong strike movement during the late Jurassic to early Cretaceous breaking up and the separation of the Gondwana. So this is the West Coast Basin that we have, the Orange Basin. We have the Sulu Land Basin and also the Durban Basin. In the East, in the South, we have the Otoniqua Basin. What we have here is the Otoniqua Basin. So the Otoniqua Basin, we have three, we have the Bedazo Basin there, Plant Moss Basin, Gantos, and Algar. Alga. These four make up the Bredasdo Basin. Then the deep water extension of these basins, excluding the Algoa, march into the Southern Otaniqua Basin. And the Southern Otaniqua Basin is where the total 
has the recent discovery. But for this work, you are going to look at the Bredasdorp basin. Let's also look at the sequence stratigraphy framework of the Bridgeado Basin. So briefly, we look at that one now. The sequence stratigraphy of the Bridgeado Basin is presented here, indicating the target zone. What you see at this rectangle is showing the target zone, which is within the lower Cretaceous. The rifting stage in South Africa ended during the Valentinian period. This was accompanied by regional uplift and extension erosion of a drift beginning unconformity. So the focus of this work, you want to look at this session, the 181. This is where we'll be looking at. So now let's go and look at flow zonation. What is flow zonation? Flow zonation is a reservoir subdivision defined on the basis of similar pore type. That is the simplest way to define flow zonation. And one of the pioneers in flow zonation is Ebang. So in terms of a reservoir flow zonation, we are looking at the petrophysical characteristics, such as the porosity and permeability relationship to define each flow. For instance, we have the core here, when the well is drilled, especially the reservoir interval, that is the area of, in, of interest to the petroleum geologist. So once the well is drilled, we normally go to that interval, retrieve some core. This is an example of the core. So once the core is being taken to the laboratory, what we do is to go at individual intervals and take up some plugs for analysis. So from that core, we cannot define what we call the little fascist. Then from that little fascist, we will go and define different pores, identify or establish different pore systems. Once we are done with that, they can now establish also, in terms of porosity and permeability relationship, the petrophysical parameters. Then once we are done with that, then we can use our model from core and also match it with the log data to now come up with our reservoir donation. The log data we have here, this is an example of a prograding sequence in the reservoir that has been defined into the different zones. Zone one, two, three, four, and five. So from this definition, we can now come up with different thicknesses and different zonation. Uh, this is just the concept of zonation. It just to give us an idea of what we mean by reservoir zonation that was proposed by Ebang in 1987. So this work I'm presenting today is also going to follow that sequence. We are looking at the reservoir intervals of the, of the wells that was drilled. So like a, we look at also the reservoir quality. What do you mean by reservoir quality? One, a reservoir is a rock that has the ability to retain and release hydrocarbon easily. So in terms of looking at the reservoir quality, which is the capability of the reservoir to store and produce hydrocarbon, that gives us the reservoir quality. So one of the key factors or the key parameters while looking at the reservoir is the pore system. Because the, reserve, the hydrocarbon actually resides within the pore system. So the pore system store and produce the hydrocarbon but they are not created equally. For instance, in the Middle East, I've, we did some work in Israel. The Middle East generally is a carbonate environment. So they have more of the pore system. So like now, and the two things that actually look at those pore system to characterize the storage and the flow of hydrocarbon is the porosity and permeability relationship. Why? Because porosity is a measure of storage of the space. Why permeability is a measure of how easily the fluid will be produced from the pore spaces. So it makes sense to actually characterize the reservoir quality and also the flow generation. With that, we cannot identify or to locate favorable pore systems that we can identify hydrocarbon. 
Also to know that in the business of the oil and gas is to make money or to make profit. But for you to be able to make that profit, you need the science. And the science is what you are going to actually look at now. So I'll now run you through the some few methods we use in our flow generation scheme. One, we use we work on three different uh, wells. Two of them are exploration wells, PA1, PA2, why PA3 is an appraisal well. We use these three wells for our reservoir generation. So we use the core data that was measured at ambient condition, the gamma ray log, cementology report, and also mineralogy. But in this presentation, I'm not going to talk on mineralogy results and also the repeat formation test results. I only present the result on flow zonation. And this work, we also use a total of 691 core plugs and 194 flow saturation measurements of the lower cretaceous of the three wells. What we did, we started by collation of the wells. After collecting the, all the data, all you have to do is our Excel, Microsoft SS spreadsheet. We put all the data there. They have now sorted out the data. They will now load, created a database in our interactive petrophysics software. We now load all the core data. Then the next thing is to now try to match the core and the log. In some cases, because of the differences in the logging, the logging depth and also the drillers depth, they don't always match. So what we do there is to try to match. This is what we call curve matching. Because in some wells, the drillers depth and the loggers depth don't match. So it makes sense to actually try to match the two before we carry out any evaluation. So the third stage we did, the third thing we did was to make sure that the core depth actually match with the loggers depth. Once we are satisfied with that, they now move to define our fashies. Why do we define fashies? Because the fashies have relationship or they control to an extent the petrophysical behaviors. So we start from the fashies and the fashies is also enable us to, to understand what type of devotional environment are you working on? So it makes sense to also start the real analysis by understanding the environment we are working on. Now we now move now after understanding after the understanding of the environment, we now carry out the main or the detailed evaluation, looking at independent uh, different uh, flow unit that exist. In this particular studies, we look at three unique flow unit methods, integrate them with the fishes then come up with our zonation scheme. So the zonation methods we are looking at again, they are the hydraulic unit, HU, and the flow unit. Within the hydraulic unit, we have the Winland method, which is the petrophysical rock type. Then we also have the hydro hydraulic, hydrostatic flow unit. We use the Mayole method. And under the flow unit, we look at this, Stratigraphic modified Lorentz plot. Once we are done with that, we now put all together to come up with a solution scheme for the Bridges Door Basin. So permit me to present some of the results we have. Now we start with the as indicated. We now look at the fasces. There are different definitions of a fasci. So a fasci, the term fasces, which is this has been the subject of considerable debate over years. But in this context, we define fasces as a distinctive body of rock formed under certain condition or environment and differ from those bodies of rocks above and below. That was the definition of uh, Gracely 1838. But over years, there have been so many definitions of fasci. So also look at fasci also can be defined on the basis of color bedding, composition, texture, and also symmetry structure. To make the work much easier for us, we just use the texture and also in terms of the, <coughs> excuse me, the symmetry structure we have and the grain sizes to define the fishes. So 
so in looking at the fascist, we came up with four different uh, fascist definition. Fashi G was a clean coercing sandstone, well sorted, well cemented, and the gamma ray value is between 27 to about 37 API. While Fashi C was a medium to coercing upward sandstone, well sorted, well cemented with trace of pirate of gamma ray value between 34 to 47. And Fashi B was fine to very fine grain sandstone with variable aggregation sandstone and streak of shale. The gamma ray value ranges between 45 to 67 API. And Fashi D was an interbedded biotobedded sandstone and shale. Very fine sandstone, gluconic, and very well cemented with gamma ray value between 43 to 47. If you compare these four different fashies in terms of the gamma ray values, you can observe that there is an overlap in terms of the gamma ray values. For instance, fashi G ranging from 27 to 37, while fashi C from 47, from 34 to 47, and fashi B from 45 to 67, while fashi D is from 45, 43 to 77. So this is the result of the three words we are looking at. This is, well, PA1. These are the fascists we've defined, fascist G, C, and D. We look at this gamma ray section. This is our reservoir interval. This is the seal above the reservoir. This is the reservoir interval we are evaluating. First, we look at, well, PA1, we can see the quasining upward of the sequence. The segments actually prograding upwards. So we have the fascist G here. C and D, while PA2, we have Fashi C, G, C, G, and B. And while PA3, we have C and two, just two fascists you identified in PA3. And the gamma ray value here can see is from zero to 150 API. So these are different fascists for different worlds. Once we are done with the fascists, the next thing is to look at the isolation evaluation. We look at the hydraulic unit method, which is the wind land method, and also the hydraulic flow unit, which is the reservoir quality index method or flow isolation method. Once we are done with that to establish different units, then we now also look at the flow unit method to understand what type of uh, to understand the storage and the flow capacity of each of those units you've identified. The hydraulic unit actually enable us to identify different hydraulic unit, but it will not tell us what type of, it will not tell us the flow or the storage capacity. That is why we have to use this stratigraphic modified Lorentz unit to also incorporate into our, into our method to actually understand the storage and the flow capacity of each of those flow units if identified. So for us to identify the flow units, we use the hydraulic unit method. To understand the storage and the flow capacity, we use the stratigraphic modified Lorentz plot. So let me, I'll now run through the hydraulic unit methods, then now go to the flow unit method. So the Winland method, Winland in 1972, he worked for Amar Then they found that on average, the port roads that are entered by a non-wetting fluid at 35% or less saturation during a capillary pressure measurement represent the pores that dominate the flow, the fluid flow in the sample. His work was published by Kolodzi in 1982, and also Winland use that Amaco's work because, sorry, Winland, sorry, Pittman used Amaco's work because Winland could not publish his work in 1972. Pittman used that work and also published and also got a different uh, port road uh, entry points. He published his work also in 1992. So the port road radius values calculated from the Winland method is used to characterize the reservoir units into petrophysical rock type 
that supports flow units in, in our interpretation. So you look at the work of Colozzi, 1980, Gonta et al, 1997, Puraz, 1999, Broad, and also there are other researchers that have used this method successfully in carbonate and also classic depositional environment of recent. How does the Wheeler method work? Simply what you need to, to carry out your Wheeler method is to have an idea of your porosity and permeability. So in this relationship you have here, we are going to calculate the pore through radius. So with your porosity value, since we have the porosity already from the core and the permeability, all you have to do is to substitute this value into this equation, they can have an idea of the pore throat radius. So what we did, we inserted the porosity and the permeability into that equation. Then we now came up with this. This is your port road radius that we have here in microns. And the port road radius, like for instance, now we have to now look at the porosity values, permeability. And the port road radius that had, we calculated values that lie between 10 to 20. They also display porosity values of 16 to 20, 22% porosity. And the permeability lies between 100 to 1,000 millidiacy, they will now group or rank those ones as very high. We group those ones as the rock type as megaporous rock type. Why? Because the porosity is between 60, 16 to 22, but the main thing we use for the ranking is our permeability. The permeability, once the permeability falls between 100 to about 1,000 millidiacy, we said it's high. And for it to be high, it must have a port row radius of between 10 to 20 microns. For a moderate zone, you should have permeability between 20 to 100 millidiacy is moderate. And the moderate are the micro pore porous rock type. For a low zone, which has a permeability between 5 to 20, we we'll classify those ones as being low. So they are also known as the mesoporous rock types. And for very low zone, they should have porosity, permeability between one to five. We regard them as very low zone. So, and they are known as microporous zones. Any permeability less than one millidiacy, you group them as being tight. So they are the nanoporous intervals. Once we are done with that, we now look to different the wells. First of all, remember, we have to establish the criteria in terms of the Winland method to identify or to classify the rock types. We establish that, they will now look at individual data set we have. We took the average for each of them, like for instance, zone one or the interval one we had is about 19.9 meters thick. The porosity was about 17.6, that's the average porosity, permeability, average about 274, it falls under the high category. So not define it as being high. Preliminarily, we just say fine, this is being high. Why preliminary? Because we want to see what other method tells us about this interval. So in terms of the port radius method, we understand that this one falls under the high. So that is the ranking or the criteria we use to rank the, reserve, the rock types we have. Once we have done with that, we now move to the next method. So we display our data. We plot the permeability here against the porosity. Plotting the porosity, permeability against porosity, we can see there are different rock types that you group. They're actually distinguishable from one another. The green color is a mega porous rock type, which is a petrophysical rock type one. They have the higher porosity, the higher porosities and also the higher permeability values. While the macro porous rock type, rock two, they are distinguishable from different rock types. So you can see the individual rock types being distinguished, the five different rock types from this method. 
So we are satisfied with this. We say, fine, we are happy with our result. I think it was able, or it enabled us to distinguish different rock types. They will now move to the other rock type method, solution method, using the flow zone indicator. The computation of the hydraulic flow unit using the flow zone indicator or the reservoir quality index. One, for you to calculate this or to use this model, you must know what you mean by reservoir quality index. You know your porosity and your permeability. Porosity and permeability, you just take the square root, multiply it by 0 0.0314. It gives you an indication of the reservoir quality index, which is in microns. Once you establish that, the next thing you have to do is to also divide your porosity with one over your porosity value. We now have your normalized porosity in fractions. Then the flow zone indicator is the ratio of the reservoir quality index to normalized porosity. You now have the flow zone indicator. So coming back to this, our result, we now soon have look at the flow zone indicator from the hydraulic flow unit method. We also have that established that the high zones or unit must have flow zone indicator values between five to 10 microns. We classify those ones are very good. Those between three to five microns, they are classified as good. While those you calculated that had values between two to three, they are fair. One to two microns are poor, and less than one micron, they are the impervious rock types or the tight zones. Again, so now this is a plot of the reservoir quality index all over the normalized porosity. So what you see here are the different uh, flow zone indicator values we have. The, we also establish five different uh, zonations. The flow zone indicator having five or more microns. They are the green colors, they plotted on a very high note. Then the one flow zone indicators between three to five. They are the brown colors, white those between two to three. Are on the blues, while the flow zone indicator that plotted between one to two microns, we use the red shading, while those plotting less than one micron is on the black color, which are the tight zones. So we are done with establishing the flow units. The next thing we are, we are now trying to look at after establishing the flow units, will these zones or unit we establish, will they be able to now store hydrocarbon? And will they be able to flow hydrocarbon? So for what, us to understand that, we now use the stratigraphic modified Lorentz plot method. The stratigraphic modified Lorentz plot method is a plot of cumulative flow capacity, which is KH, which is permeability and the thickness versus cumulative storage capacity, porosity times your thickness, which are functions of our porosity and permeability. How do we construct that? So we have to look at the steps we use to construct the simplify, modify Lorentz plot. Step one, we determine the thickness. Step two, we now pair the porosity with that thickness. Step three, we normalize step two by dividing each sample with the sum of the paired values of the porosity and the thickness. Step four, you cumulatively add each of those three steps from one to three, we now get what we call the cumulative storage capacity. Step five, now once we are done with that of the porosity, we do the same thing we flow step two to four for permeability. So in that case, we started by actually determining, we know the thickness already, which is our H. We now go step two, we multiply the permeability values we have for each sample with the thickness. We normalize it by taking the sum of all the samples. Then we now divide it. Then cumulatively, we now add all of them to now get what we call also the cumulative storage capacity. Once we are done with that, then we can now 
plot the cumulative flow capacity against the storage capacity. So once we've plotted that, the next thing is to now make interpretation. Step one for interpretation, you identify significant change in slope, which represent a flow unit. Step two, a flat trend represent a barrier, could be a seal or a tight, where no flow occur. Step three, segments on the plot that plot greater than 45 degrees are high speed zones, or they have higher flow potential and lower storage capacity. Step four, you also to know that segments on the plot that slope less than 45 degrees are called barriers or sorry, the buffer zones. So the, the buffer zones normally have higher storage capacity and lower flow capacity. So for you to know, please let's just take note of these three key things. The barrier or the seal or the tight zone, the high speed zone, and also the buffer zones. So these are the three things we need to actually classify or identify our plot from the Lorentz plot to know is that zone or that interval, is it a barrier? Is it going to act as a high speed interval or is it going to act as a buffer zone? So now let's quickly look at the plots. I've done some plotting here. These are the flow units, flow units one, two, three, and four. Flow unit one plotted between here to this point. Should I, will I ask a question? Is it a baffle zone, a high speed zone, or a baffle? How can I classify my flow unit one? Hello, please. Can I ask a question, please? So you can see I've done the plotting, I've plotted cumulative flow capacity against the storage capacity. For instance, I have my flow unit one here. I have four different flow units. Flow unit one, flow unit two, flow unit three, and flow unit four. You can see that flow unit one actually plotted above 45 degrees. 45 degrees is B. Sorry, if it is 45 degrees two between this line, these are 45 degrees. So if you look at this one, actually plotted above 45 degrees. So this is our what? high speed zone. So if you look at here, looking at 45 degrees here, it's actually plotting on the 45 degrees line and a bit below. So this could be our baffle zone. And this from here, looking at 45 degrees, this is our flat trend. So this flat trend represents our seal or our barrier. And this other one flow unit four, also plus below the 45 degrees, so it should be our buffer. So to interpret this curve, I have my high speed here, high speed zone, my buffer zone, high speed to buffer zone, then also have my seal or the barrier unit, then also have my buffer zone. So that is how we interpret our simplified modified Lorentz plot. So have the plots for different, for the other two, two wells, you see the plot differently based on the data we have. This for well PA2. Then this is also for well PA3. So if you observe the three wells, they plotted differently and they have different flow units. So this is a summary for the simplify modify Lorentz plot. For instance, we are looking at well PA2. You see flow unit one has about 12 storage percent storage capacity and 22 flow capacity. Flow unit two of that same well has six 16 percent storage and about three percent flow capacity. Flow unit three has about 54 storage and 72 flow capacity. So in a nutshell, this is just how to interpret our simplified more Lorentz plot. So once we are done with that now, we now plotted with our wild land log. So here we define the zones, the high zone here. The high zone you can see that the high zone is actually within the first G. 
and the flight, the high zone actually have our petrophysical rod type one, hydraulic fluid method one, then also the flow unit one and flow unit two. In a zone, you may have more than one flow unit. Please take note of that, that in a zone, you may have more than one flow unit in a zone. So in our moderate zone two, we also have your yeah, petrophysical rod type two, hydraulic flow unit rod type two, then different, uh, then also is made up of fascist C. Then below that one is our tight zone, which is fascist D that we've defined previously. This is the result for PA2. Looking at the flow, you see different flow units. And also to add our FUE you have here is what we call the flow unit efficiency. For you to determine the flow unit efficiency, what you have to do is a very simple thing. Divide the cumulative flow capacity you've identified with, divide it against your storage capacity. Then you now, you now maybe determine or derive your flow unit efficiency. So the flow unit efficiency is we divide the flow, cumulative flow capacity with the storage capacity. Then we now got the flow unit efficiency. So for well PA3, you identified six different flow zones. And for well PA3, we also identified three different flow zones. So in conclusion, 12 flow zones, we are delineated as high, moderate, low, very low and tight. The higher moderate zones we identified in well PA1, PA2, and they are associated with high flow capacities. Reservoir quality is generally decreases from the upper part of the reservoir towards the base due to the changes in pore sizes with fascist G identifies as having the best quality rock property. In general, the lower part of the reservoirs is a tight zone composed of fascist D, which is an impervious rock type having the lowest rock quality. The fine grain sandstones with low permeability, their permeability less than one milli are associated with tight zones, while the high and the moderate zones show average permeability values higher than 270 milli dioceses. And these ones are associated with the medium to coarse grain sandstones of fascist G. Thanks to Petroleum Agency of South Africa that supply us with the data set and also the oil and gas company, Petrese, for the creation of the data. And we also express our thanks to Synergy Oil Company for the provision of the petrophysics software. For those who are interested to read more on South Africa, I've also included some link the Petroleum Agency of South Africa, you cannot read more to understand the petroleum history, exploration and production history of South Africa. If you want to know more, again, also on sequence stratigraphy and the petroleum systems, I've also indicated some useful references on the seismic expressions and rock physics. To that. Thank you very much, uh, Mimo. So, time for questions. Thank you very much, Mimo. Um, I open the podium for questions for everybody that wants to, to ask Mimo something. Mm. As I don't see all the faces in the screen, so just jump in and with a question rather than waiting. Okay. Yeah. Hello, sir. I, yes. I definitely have a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation, sir. Uh, the, the last time we met was at uh, the international conference in Lagos. Uh, well, uh, I know you still remember that at the APG stand. So yes. <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, well, I, I, I have a question, I have two questions. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the first one has to do with the uh, the flow curve you showed us. That's where you talked about uh, the porosity and the models that came up. I mean, the angle. You talk about the angle less than 45 and the uh, greater than uh, 45 zone. Uh, for the well one and well three, it seems those ones look consistent, but uh, that of the second one is not with that. I assume it is at uh, the the fishy, fishy characteristics. But the first well, which gives us the very good uh, flow zone, that uh, fishy G. Yes, yes, this curves, yes. The, the fishy G, the, the fishy are uh, the same, but then you, you from your last uh, results, it shows that we still have different, we have variation in their porosity range of uh, percentage. What could be responsible to, for that? I mean, we have the same package of fishy and the <coughs> porosity varies along the line. Considering that they are same fishy and others, what could be responsible for that? That's one. Then the second question is, how do we model this particular character into our programs? For instance, we are doing a petrophysical model. That's the variation. Okay, thank you. So can I take, Nico, can I answer the question immediately? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. I think, are you, is that Gabriel, right? <laughs> yes, it's Gabriel. Okay, Gabriel. Thank you. How are you, Gabriel? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, thank you for your question. I tried to take note of your question. You said the flow curve in well one and three are consistent, except in well one. I think so. I so now, well two. well two. This is well two, right? Yes. Yes. So the well two, what you mean by one? Once we've constructed the flow against the storage, for instance, in the well two that you have here, see FU1. In some places, you see what we use to define the flow unit, it must have a significant change. The interval must have a significant change. Like these manual changes you see here, they're not significant. So we took here from year to year as a significant change. And the main contributors to this change is mostly maybe the grain size, the change in those permeability and the mineralogy of those fasces. So these are the things that influence the responses of the permeability that we record in different, uh, different intervals. That is why like in fasces, in this uh, PA2, you have this a bit erroneous uh, points, but remember as a criteria, it must have a significant change. Once the change is not significant, you don't need to necessarily group it as a flow unit. That is why like you said like, uh, fashion one is more consistent because you see more changes. So in this case, you see this interval, it is more homogeneous. Possibly the permeability is almost the same. So since there are variation, that means there's a big change in either porosity or permeability. So like in this case here, like if you look at PA1, from this point to this point, you see it's almost homogeneous, it's just flat. That means those parameters are just almost or relatively uniform. So does that answer your question a bit on that before I move to the next one? Sorry, uh, Gabriel, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. What did you say? The next question is said about fasces are the same. What is responsible yeah. for changes in fasces? Yes, that uh, in situations like that, I mean the in particular, that's the 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 G zone, fasci G from yes. the stratigraphy you show us. The results indicate that there are some changes. Uh, along the line, I mean, uh, production uh, efficiency. These little changes, yes, this fishy G. Okay. The, the, the FI units and the HFU notes beneath 
along show some little changes. How do we incorporate these changes into a model? Because as little as they are, they may also create some little uh, responses to, to the entire world or yes. zone. As it may be. <clears throat> Thank you for your question again. Yeah, like in this case here, you see a fashi G in the upper part of the reservoir. This is a very clear shore face environment. You see this fashi here, definitely has a very better reservoir quality here. We are looking at the G, right? Yes, yes. So in terms of, if you compare the G and the fashies we are looking at mostly, what makes fashie changes? Remember the zonation or the classification of fashies we use two criteria. We use one was the wildland log pattern. And secondly, the texture and the grain size. That's what we use. But this must not always tally with our petrophysical properties. Why? Because the petrophysical properties, they are looking at mostly, we use the porosity and the permeability. So it depends on what constitute that fish is. For instance, this fish, if you have maybe, it depends on the mineralogy. So in most cases, what you do, we encourage people to also carry out mineralogy analysis to know what type of mineral do you have in each of those fish. Another one question is asked, how do we in incorporate this into a into a program? Is that right? Yes, yes, into the modeling uh, yes. aspect. Yes. For you to model, you are, I keep telling people the first thing you do, remember the well has been drilled. This analysis is just within one interval of the well, the reservoir. So normally we go to the reservoir, we are trying to build our static geological model. Okay. Once we are done with that, we now populate it. That is where, for instance, here, yeah, if you come, let me, sorry, let me take you back. Yes, for instance, here, yeah, you've defined this. So you see the imperial relationships you have for each of those fascists. For instance, I want to predict the essence of building that model. You want to build a reliable model so that at any other interval in the well that you don't have core, you can predict the fishes at that point. What type of rock type do you expect? So for you to do that, you use these empirical relationships that you have. For instance, if I want to predict about my petrophysical rock type one, I use this relationship. 5.55 times my porosity all to power 0 0.47. The power relationship will give me an idea of that type of fishes that I don't have the core or even a nearby well that I don't have any core data. So that's why we are trying to now establish an empirical relationship to now give an estimate of what you should expect in other areas within the well. So that's one of the ways you can incorporate it into your into your program. Does that answer your question a bit? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Mimo. Uh, somebody has has questions for Mimo. Nicholas. Yes, please. Because what you just said is that I want to show show the constant. It could change, so we have to follow the changes. Yes. Uh, please, uh, Tzvi, go okay. ahead. A short question. Mimonito, uh, <clears throat> this is a nice talk. I just want a short question to ask you. This uh, sand reservoir, where do you think the sand comes from? Because the area is very much dominated by the Benguela current, strong current that go from the northeast to the southwest. So what the, the those reservoir of sand, where is the nearest land? that they come from? Well, what do you think? The nearest land they came from, you mean the sand? Sorry, please, can you take the question again, please? I didn't get it very well. Hello? Tzvi uh, was yes. asking, where, what is the source of the sand coming to, the, to this uh, unit? 
Can you hear me, Gabriel? Okay, I can hear you now. You hear me now? Yes, I, I can hear you. I the area is dominated by the Benguela current. It's a very yes. strong current. Very strong, so yes. So where, where do you think this sand come from? Okay, I just want to use this an example to give you where the sand come from. I think I can. Let me give you. Okay. Can you, uh, you can see this presentation, right? Yep. Yeah, for instance, here yeah, we have here, can, to give you an idea where you think the sand, in my opinion, where the sand comes from. The sand comes from two different, remember in this area, look at the Bredasdo Basin. Okay. So the, the sand is being sourced mostly from, you see the intervals of the source, where the sand is being sourced from. From the sea reef, that's where I mostly see the sands coming from. Oh, okay. Thanks. Fine, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Imonito. Um, somebody else has a question? Okay. Well, um, um, I, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, why trying to uh, to trying to make a misfit between the core log and um, the driller's log and the chorus log? You know, to tie. What are the considerations you make in tying their misfit? And is there any accepted percentage of mis misfit that can be that can be accepted for, for, for tying the two blocks. Thank you so much. That's a very nice question. Nothing that is, I think the idea is that it must tie properly. If it's not, if it doesn't tie properly, then your interpretation is wrong. To tie it, normally we normally use our shell, maybe our shell point within that reservoir as our reference. Because if you see like any shell point where there is maybe a pronounced shell point in your core, use that as a reference, then look for it in your while and log. So once you see that similar peak in your gamma ray log, it's an indication of your shell. They cannot match the two. Does that help you in your question? Because definitely in some wells, is it, it not a perfect? Is it always a perfect condition or there are some cases that you need to accept some, to have some assumptions about their fit lines? I think it must match because if it doesn't match, you won't get your target properly. And you remember even one meter, if you miss your target with a meter, that's a lot of loss. So we try as much as possible to make sure both of them will match. They must match for it to have a very reliable interpretation or result. In a case where they don't match, should we terminate the, 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 the section or what will happen to the section? We disregard the section. No, in case where it doesn't, it, for instance, if they drill the well, like all these wells I used to work, they were drilled in the 90s. So what they did was after drilling the wells, the drilling company, you look at the well header information first. These wells were drilled by Slumberge. So you look at the log data information. I keep telling people the first thing you have to do, in my opinion, once you receive the data, look at the well header information. The well header information will tell you the driller's depth and also the core logger depth. That is why at times when you use your core and load it into the well and log, it will not there will be mismatch. So the first thing we do normally is to make sure we correct that mismatch. Make sure your data set if it's core, it must always match with your while and log. Because if you don't marry the two well, definitely your result will not be reliable. So if it's while and log data you're working with, even though you want to match it with your seismic or whatever, please let's establish the depth first. In your seismic, you might be looking at the true vertical depth. Most while and logs, they are measured depth. We must make sure we take care of those differences in our depth before we can now move on with our interpretation. So it, to me, it has to match. We must have a relationship to make it match before we cannot carry out our interpretation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, welcome. 
Thank you very much. Is that Lawal? Is that Lawal? This is really one. Oh, okay. How are you? I'm fine, sir. How are you too, sir? Don't worry. High five is my second home. I'll be there <laughs> hopefully by, by December also. Yeah. We are happy to have you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mimonito. I think uh, we need to close the session for this time. We are already deep into the second hour. So again, thank you everybody and for attending. Thank you, Mimonito. Would you like to be um, um, to receive the emails about the department seminars? Yes, yes, please. That would be nice. Excellent. Because next week, as I mentioned, we have we are moving from Cape Town to New York, from a beautiful city to another beautiful city. Okay. That's so good. Uh, so stay tuned. Okay. Have a good week. And enjoy the summer in South Africa. You too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. See you next week. Goodbye.